Let us begin the programming for the day, if we may. Uh, as you will see from the agenda, the first topic is trust accounting for the solo and small firm practitioner. Uh, if you don't know Jim McCauley from the State Bar, you should. Uh, this gentleman. I think that was me. He's terrible with the mic. He's wow. great with that. This thing's hot. Sorry. Well, I think that says it all. Please welcome Jim McCall. <laughs>
the bank honors it anyway, the bank A must report the check drawn on insufficient funds to the Virginia State Bar, or B, the bank doesn't have to report it because, because the check didn't bounce. check is good. The fact that it was drawn on insufficient funds triggers a reporting requirement to the Virginia State Bar. Uh, in, in the past, uh, the reporting requirement was only necessary uh, if, if the check was bounced, if it was an uh, overdrawn uh, instrument. But now, if it's drawn on insufficient funds and the bank has uh, uh, an overdraft protection plan for their customers, uh, that, that, che that check will clear, uh, but it still has to be reported to the bar. And, and th this is the rule, uh, one point, rule 1.15, which is in the Rules of Professional Conduct in paragraph 20. And how does the bar, how does the bar enforce this? Uh, we can't regulate banks with you know, the State Corporation Commission does, but the bar has a contract with each of the banks and that in order for lawyers uh, to place their trust accounts with the bank, it has to be an approved financial institution. And so uh, that, that's the enforcement mechanism for uh, overdraft reporting. important lesson. There are no specific types of records required to maintain the trust account. True or false? Seventy-five percent said false. Twenty-five percent true. There are required records. Uh, we have removed some of the terminology and uh, jargon from the rules itself, but there are essentially three types of records that, that have to be maintained. Uh, a, a record that tracks income receipts or an income receipts journal, a journal uh, that tracks disbursements out of the trust account, and a subsidiary ledger, or sometimes referred to as a sub-account or client account, that tracks funds received by the lawyer and dispersed by the lawyer for each specific client. Those are the three records uh, that would be required Otherwise, you would not be able to properly account for funds held and received uh, for clients and third parties. Uh, but this is just the, uh, an old, uh, old school form for a cash receipts journal. There's not much to it. Cash disbursements journal. But most of this is uh, computerized now. Uh, there's software uh, that allows you to track your income and, and disbursement and also keep track of funds received and dispersed for each client. And so it's a pretty much an automated process now uh, in the digital age. What funds must be deposited into the trust account? A, any funds received by the lawyer or B, any funds that don't belong to the lawyer? on the client's behalf or at the client's direction. 
then those are escrowed funds too and belong in the trust account. All funds received by the lawyer for future litigation expenses are also trust funds that have to go into the trust account. All funds received by the lawyer for the benefit of the client or for other third parties, uh, payments uh, for reports, experts, medical bills, uh, and so forth. All, all those funds don't belong to the lawyer, therefore they go into the trust account. Funds that may not be put in the trust account. Funds that belong to the lawyer do not belong in the trust account. They belong in the operating account. There's an exception, two exceptions actually. Uh, the funds necessary to pay bank charges can be uh, funds that the, that the lawyer can deposit into the trust account to avoid imposition of charges, uh, minimum balance requirements, and so forth. Uh, once, uh, the second exception is what I call the mixed funds exception. This is like when a lawyer gets a settlement check. Part of the money belongs to the lawyer. Part of the money belongs to the client. The check still has to be placed in the trust account, but the lawyer's share of the mixed fund deposit should be transferred promptly from the trust account to the operating account. Uh, got a way in us. Uh, this is counting down right now. Bank charges $25 a month if the lawyer's IOLTA account goes below $5,000. The lawyer may deposit $5,000 to maintain the balance, or they cannot because it's commingling. Lawyer may be positive. If you were watching the last slide, the answer was actually in there. I need to switch those around. Anyway, that's the correct answer. You can you can maintain a sufficient amount in the account uh, to avoid uh, the bank imposing a service charge. Uh, that, it could be a substantial amount of money. I mean, at five thousand dollars, but uh, if you don't if you don't maintain that balance, then the bank is automatically debiting from other clients' funds, and that's a no-no. You can't, you can't let that happen. And so, and this is actually in, in the rule itself that the lawyer can uh, place a sufficient amount of money in the trust account to avoid the imposition of those fees. The client owes a third-party judgment creditor $10,000. The lawyer is holding the proceeds of a sale of the client's business in trust. May that judgment creditor garnish the lawyer's trust account? A, yes. B, no. Yes, the judgment creditor may garnish uh, the, the, the trust account. If the judgment creditor has a judgment and they and they execute on that judgment with a live writ and serve the lawyer uh, with a summons, and garnishment, or suggestion in garnishment for funds uh, of the judgment debtor, who is also the lawyer's client. Uh, th those funds uh, can, be, can be garnished and the lawyer is obligated uh, to, to pay over to the judgment creditor. In this uh, Marcus Santoro and Kozak case, the lawyers were hold, two law firms were holding funds uh, for a client. And unfortunately, they had also not promptly withdrawn legal fees that were owed to them as well. But the court held, the uh, trial court held that the uh, accounts, trust accounts were subject to garnishment and the Supreme Court of Virginia affirmed. <laughs> so uh, you do need to be aware of this, that uh, the, the funds, uh, the analysis is quite simple. The funds that are in the trust account don't belong to the lawyer, right? And, and there, are, there are funds being held for a specific client Garnish, a, gar, a garnishment creditor, a judgment creditor with, with a garnishment 
uh, can go after those funds, and they are subject to garnishment. Lawyer settles a client's personal injury case for ninety thousand. The lawyer's agreement is not clear whether the one third fee comes off the top or after expenses are deducted. The lawyer claims a thirty thousand dollar fee. The client asserts that the lawyer only gets twenty five thousand. A, the lawyer may withdraw the $25,000. B, the lawyer must hold $30,000 in trust until they get the dispute resolved. The correct answer is A. The lawyer can and should uh, withdraw promptly undisputed funds from, from the trust account. To the extent that the lawyer's legal fees are not in dispute, and, and since the, the only disputed amount in this example is the $5,000 difference. So only $5,000 needs to be held back in trust. Uh, the remaining $25,000 should be transferred from the trust account to the operating account. Now, your fee agreement needs to state uh, and inform the client whether or not a one-third contingent fee or whatever percentage contingent fee you use is calculated based upon the gross recovery or the net recovery after expenses are paid. It makes a difference, uh, particularly uh, the, the more money that's involved. Uh, and, and that needs to be explained to the client so the client understands. Uh, most lawyers presumably are going to take their contingency fee off the top from the gross recovery and, and then the client's recovery is further reduced by uh, net uh, expenses before you get to the net recovery. That just needs to be explained to the client so that they understand that. Uh, if, if, that if that is not clear, uh, then you're going to have a problem because uh, if there's an ambiguity in the fee agreement, guess who gets, uh, gets that constri strictly construed against them? The lawyer. 2011 amendments to Rule 1.15 add a new level of obligation for a lawyer to protect client funds against which the general creditor has a claim. True or false? Almost a split here. The correct answer is false. Uh, the, the amendments that went into effect in 2011, there were uh, some substantial uh, amendments made to the trust account rules, actually a, a rework of the trust account rules. But it did not change pre-existing rules regarding duties of lawyers owed to third-party creditors of the client. Comment 4 uh, to Rule 1.15 actually says that there is no duty to general creditors. Now, when I, when I did that, uh, the, the, Mark, the Marcus Santoro Kozak case that you saw up there, uh, that creditor was not a general creditor. That was a judgment creditor with a live writ of execution and a garnishment. That's different. General creditors are, are third parties that have claims against your client, uh, but they either have not reduced those claims to judgment, they're unliquidated, uh, or they haven't uh, performed the necessary tasks to establish a lien on the funds that the lawyer is handling. And that's the key here. The uh, lawyer is only obligated to protect third party claims if that third party is legally entitled to the specific funds that the lawyer is hand handling for the client. Here's another example. A lawyer has a consensual chiropractor's lien uh, or an assignment of benefits or some other document that in which the client has promised to the chiropractor that the chiropractor will be paid out of the funds of, the, of their recovery when they settle the case. The client disputes the amount that's owed to the chiropractor and there are not sufficient funds recovered by the lawyer uh, for the lawyer to pay the chiropractor 
and for the uh, client to receive anything out of the settlement. What can you do? Pay the chiropractor to lean in full? Split the difference and make both parties unhappy? Hold the funds until the dispute is resolved? Or call ethics counsel? until the dispute is resolved. That's the best answer. Although some people went for D, and I appreciate that. <laughs> that, that number is 804-775-0564. Um, you know, use it, call it, call off and uh, use our ethics online. Uh, if, if, you, if you can't, if you can't uh, get through or you need um, uh, a quick answer and don't want to play phone tag, we've got an uh, ethics hotline email uh, that's ethics hotline one word at vsb.org ethics hotline at VSB, vsb .org. so you can use your smartphone uh, and, and tap out uh, a quick question you can visit the bar's website we already have an online uh, uh, inquiry form that you can use and you can just uh, tap, tap out your, your inquiry and send it into the bar You'll get an auto reply that we received your message, and then uh, one of our lawyers will follow up and give you an answer. But the best, the best thing to do in this case is to hold the funds in the trust account uh, until until the dispute is resolved. A lawyer is obligated to protect not just statutory liens, but also consensual liens that are created between the lawyer uh, and the health care provider. Even if the lawyer did not sign anything, there's still an ethical responsibility if the lawyer is aware that the client is obligated to pay a health care provider and that health care provider has properly uh, protected their lien or in some cases that they're not required to give notice of lien and all, all that is required is that the lawyer knows that the client received treatment from uh, that health care provider and that, that creates a lien and therefore an obligation of the lawyer to protect not only the client's interest but also that third party's interest. The client wants to use a credit card for payment of an advanced fee. The credit card company wants to charge a merchant transaction fee and deduct the fee automatically from the lawyer's trust account. Can the lawyer have such an arrangement with the credit card company? A, yes. B, no. Essentially, is asking for a refund. 
And, and the answer that Leo 1848 gives is that, well, this isn't any different th than a transaction done without a, tr uh, uh, a credit card where the lawyer has earned the fee, has transferred the fee from the uh, trust account to the operating account, and sometime later, the, the client comes back and demands a refund. And you, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The lawyer, if the lawyer could refund the money uh, from the operating account, and that's, then that's okay. Uh, so that really is the only way to address that situation on chargebacks, except uh, if, if the lawyer knows that the client intends to challenge the fee while the funds are still in, in the trust account, then the lawyer will just leave those funds in the trust account until the dispute can be resolved. A lawyer holds unclaimed funds in his trust account. The lawyer may A, transfer funds to the operating account, B, transfer funds to the Legal Services Corporation of Virginia under IOLTA, C, report and transfer funds to the state treasury. Correct answer is C. Uh, the, uh, the, the correct answer is C, report and transfer the funds to the state treasury. Uh, a is wrong because a lawyer can never claim funds that didn't belong to them. B is wrong because there's no provision for this under the IELTA rules for uh, LSCB to receive funds. C is the correct answer because abandoned property or unclaimed property held by a fiduciary escheats to the Commonwealth uh, under the Uniform Disposition of Unclaimed Property Act in Title 55 of the Code of Virginia. Uh, and there, are two, there are two Leo's legal ethics opinions that say that if a lawyer has unclaimed funds uh, held in trust, that the appropriate thing to do is to uh, fill out the form. You can go to the controller's website. Uh, it's actually on the uh, uh, virginia.gov uh, website. Uh, find Treasury, you'll, have, you'll actually see a button for unclaimed funds. And you can get a form uh, to report the unclaimed funds. Uh, and then the funds uh, are delivered to the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth uh, publishes uh, uh, unclaimed property and funds uh, in the newspaper, after which the money goes to the literary fund. Here's a problem. The lawyer has ceased practicing law that owns as a sole shareholder a title company that handles funds for real estate closings. May the lawyer's title agency earn and keep interest earned on funds held to close real estate transactions. Yes, because the lawyer is not practicing law and not subject to the rules of professional conduct. B, no, interest cannot be taken by the lawyer's title agency. The correct answer is B. The rules of professional conduct have, have nothing to do with this. The, uh, question is really governed by uh, by statute. It used to be called CRESPA, Consumer Real Estate Settlement Practices Act. Now it's called the Real Estate Settlement Chapter. Sort of lost its, lost its appeal. I, I like to press it. Uh, but that's the, stat, that's the code section. And really, uh, if you are a registered settlement agent, whether you're a lawyer or a title company or a real estate broker, uh, you, you cannot uh, take any interest off of funds being held uh, in a real estate escrow account. Prior to retaining you as counsel, your client and her husband had retained another attorney. After they discharged the first attorney and retained you, the first attorney notified you of a lien for $375, which he claims is the value of his services. As far as you know, he never notified the defendant's insurance company of his lien, and the settlement check was made payable to you and your client only. You now have dispersed the proceeds to your client while withholding $375 in your trust account. What should you do? Just 
disbursed the $375 to the client if the client so directs. A, continue to hold the funds in trust pending resolution of the notice issue. Best answer is to hold those funds in trust pending resolution of the notice issue. Uh, once you've determined that uh, they haven't done what is necessary to properly perfect the lien, then the funds can be released to the client. Uh, but the best thing to do is to hold the funds in the account pending resolution of that issue. Uh, and this comes back again to comment four. Unless the lawyer can determine that the former attorney is not entitled to the funds because of the failure to provide the notice, the safest course is to hold the funds in trust. If the lawyer believes in good faith and after due diligence that the former lawyer is not entitled to payment, the lawyer may disperse those funds to the client. Now this is new. Uh, th this is something new that has been added uh, to uh, duties to owe to third parties. Pri prior to the amendment of, of comment four, the lawyer's options were uh, to hold the funds in trust or interplead the funds in the court if there was a dispute. Uh, this comment adds another safe harbor, allowing the lawyer to disperse the funds uh, to either the, uh, the client or the third party. There, there are some potential liability risks uh, in doing so. Uh, and it's clear uh, if you read Elio 1865, particularly when we, when we talk about uh, Medicare and, and Medicaid liens and ERISA uh, sub uh, subrogation claims and so forth, that the lawyer may make a good faith decision and disperse the funds, but if they're wrong uh, and the federal government enforces its rights, uh, there may be potential liability exposure even though the lawyer's conduct uh, was proper un under, under the ethics rules. And that's because the ethics rules are ethics rules. They're not rules that determine the liability of uh, parties or uh, the legality of claims. A lawyer may be suspended from practice for mishandling client funds, even if the client suffers no loss. is true. Even if the client is not separate injury, a lawyer may be suspended from practice for violation uh, of the trust account rules. A loss of money is not a uh, prerequisite uh, in a disciplinary proceeding against an attorney. Uh, discipline can be, uh, can occur if a lawyer is engaged in intentional and willful uh, mishandling the funds or uh, negligence in failing to properly maintain uh, the required records and ensure uh, that that funds are, are dispersed uh, in a proper manner. The client agrees to pay the lawyer $5,000 for a matter and there is a non-refundable flat, flat fee uh, requirement or that is earned upon receipt. That's what the lawyer's contract says. $5,000 due up front. Non refundable fee. Is this unethical or B? Okay. The correct answer is A. It is never proper for a lawyer to have a non-refundable uh, fee provision in their contract unless the contract is a classic general retainer. But this is a fixed fee contract. A fixed fee contract is a, is a flat fee that the lawyer charges for performing a specific matter for a client. I will, I will represent you uh, on, on a uh, DUI charge for $5,000. When is that fee earned? fee is earned when the lawyer finishes the work. When is the work finished? 
whenever the lawyer disposes of the case uh, in court or, or by plea agreement. It may be possible for the lawyer and the client to agree that in the course of representing the client in a fixed fee contract that certain portions of the fees are, are earned as certain tasks are performed. For example, in, in, a, in a defending a felony criminal case, the lawyer might have a contract that says that the fee could be earned, uh, or part of the fee could be earned, say $1,000, uh, for the bail hearing, uh, $2,000 for prelim, balance due when the lawyer uh, disposes of the case by plea agreement or by trial. So uh, the lawyer can put milestones in a fixed fee agreement that specify when certain portions of those fees have become due, in which case the lawyer must promptly transfer those earned fees out of the trust account and into the operating account. So a fixed fee is an advance fee and it always remains the property of the client until the lawyer earns the fee. The, the, fee belongs to, the fee belongs to the client until the lawyer has earned the fee. If the lawyer terminate, if the client or lawyer terminates the representation uh, before the tasks have been completed, then the unearned fees have to be refunded to the client. There may be, if, if the lawyer is terminated in midstream before they've completed the contract, they're entitled to be compensated on a quantum merit basis. They cannot enforce the original fee agreement against the client. That applies not only to fixed fee contracts, but also to contingent fee contracts, such as where a lawyer says, if you fire me, uh, I, I claim one third of the last settlement offer that you rejected. That's not gonna work. A lawyer can only be compensated on a quantum merit basis. Client agrees that the lawyer is entitled to 33 to 30 contingency fee. However, if the lawyer is terminated prior to completion of the case, then the case reverts to an hourly rate of $250 an hour for work completed by the lawyer. A, is this ethical? B, is this okay? answer is A. The correct answer is A. This is a conversion clause. Uh, basically what the, what the provision uh, attempts to do is convert the contingency fee agreement into an hourly agreement whenever the client exercises a bare right to discharge the lawyer. Part of the policy consideration here is that the lawyer, uh, the client's right to fire the lawyer is almost absolute. And any attempt to impinge upon that client's right uh, it is looked at uh, with the John's view from, uh, uh, from the bar regulator's point of view. A conversion clause of this sort is improper according to L LEO 1812. Uh, because it's ambiguous, also, it attempts to turn the contract into an hourly fee arrangement. The Heinzman case decided by the Supreme Court of Virginia said that when a contingency fee agreement is terminated before there is a recovery, the contract is a nullity. And so therefore, uh, these conversion clauses are not effective and they're improper. Client agrees if lawyer fires a client prior to completion of the matter, the lawyer is entitled to quantum merit value of the lawyer's services rendered to date. A, unethical, B, okay.
Either way, the result's the same. Yeah, the, the lawyer could fire the client. The lawyer, the lawyer can discharge uh, or terminate the representation as long as they can do so without material adverse effect on the client, or if they have a basis uh, for uh, the grounds for termination. But you don't have to have grounds for determination as long as you can withdraw without material adverse effect. Uh, if you're in litigation, of course, you're going to have to get leave of court uh, to withdraw from the representation. So we've reached the end of our program.